a massive Soviet bomber so big, it carried its own fleet of fighter jets. A secret war machine designed to strike deep behind enemy lines. Unstoppable, untraceable, and unlike anything the world had ever seen. But was it a genius invention or a desperate gamble? Let's uncover the story of the Soviet Union's flying aircraft carriers. Hi friends. In August 1941, three lumbering. Soviet bombers head towards Nazi-allied territory. But these are no ordinary bombers. Because for years, the Soviets have been secretly developing a new kind of weapon. Flying aircraft carriers. Designed to pierce through enemy lines to deploy a swarm of fighter planes and dive bombers. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. And with the Soviet Union's darkest hour approaching, these massive juggernauts are about to make history. Because they're headed straight for enemy territory. By the 1930s, it was clear that aircraft would play an essential role in future conflicts. But there was a problem that had plagued aircraft designers from the very beginning. Large heavy bombers could carry lots of fuel so they could fly great distances. But fighter aircraft, which had to be light and agile, could carry only enough fuel to cover a short distance. This mismatch had consequences. While bombers could fly deep into enemy territory, their fighter escorts couldn't. And over hostile airspace the bombers were often on their own. With only a handful of machine guns to fend off enemy fighters, they were vulnerable and suffered heavy losses. But in 1930, Soviet engineer Vladimir Vokmistrov came up with a radical solution. Actually, it's pretty straightforward, if you could have the bombers carry the fighters, they could be transported over great distances and deployed whenever they were needed. At first, Vokmistrov's idea fell on deaf ears. The Red Army was focused on strength through numbers, not gambling on unproven ideas. But Vokmistrov pressed on. Comrades, flying aircraft carriers have tremendous potential. The fighters could not only protect the bombers, they could be fitted with their own bombs to make precise strikes against more challenging targets. Or they could be carried far out to sea to attack naval fleets which would otherwise be out of range. The fighters could even clear the path for our bombers by destroying enemy anti-aircraft guns in advance, or by blinding them with smoke screens, making accurate targeting impossible. Flying aircraft carriers could also patrol our borders, remaining airborne, ready to intercept enemy bombers before they made it anywhere near their targets. The strategic benefits couldn't be ignored. Not even by the Red Army. The platform for Vokmistrov's aircraft carriers would be the mighty TB-1 and TB-3. As the largest bombers of their time, they had plenty of power to carry the fighters. But figuring out where to attach them was the tricky part. In the wrong spot, the fighters would interfere with the bombers' control, or airflow would make launching them impossible. And in an era before sophisticated wind tunnels it would all have to be figured out through trial and error. Vokmistrov would call his creations Vino. And he would end up flight testing more than a dozen configurations. In some models the fighters were mounted above the wings and others suspended below. One arrangement even saw five fighters carried at once. Remarkably, instead of weighing the bomber down the fighters actually helped to boost their performance. Because during flight, the fighters would run their engines continuously, while drawing fuel from additional tanks fitted to the bomber. This brilliant setup allowed the bombers to fly faster, climb higher, and lift even more than they could without the fighters attached. Launching the fighters was fairly straightforward. As long as the bomber was kept steady, any reasonably skilled pilot would manage. But reattaching to the carrier was another matter. On later versions, a trapeze-like system allowed pilots to dock with the carrier to take on more fuel. But docking was a skill that would take time to master. During flight, the fighters would communicate with the carrier using a telephone system and a series of lights mounted in front of their gun sights would further signal commands. Everyone was pleased with how Zvino flew, but on the ground things were more challenging. To load the fighters over the wings, we'd need all the help we could get, calling over mechanics, ground controllers and anyone else unfortunate enough to be at the airfield. We all wondered if we could ever get used to such a strenuous task. And then everything changed for the better when the Communist Party provided us with a tractor. But the flying aircraft carrier concept was viable. And Vokmistrov had laid the groundwork for something truly remarkable. Vokmistrov envisioned building enormous airborne mother ships, capable of carrying more than 20 fighters. He also wanted to develop purpose-built fighters that wouldn't need heavy landing gear and could be built with smaller wings for greater speed and maneuverability. Of course, these ideas would have to wait until the Zvino carriers had proven useful to the Red Army. But after years of development, that turned out to be far more difficult than anticipated. Back in 1932, the Red Army seemed eager to accept the first version. But when new I-5 fighters became available, Vokmistrov was ordered to modify his design. 
Then, when the more powerful four-engine TB3 bomber was introduced, Vakmastrov was once again sent back to the drawing board. It was the same story when I-16 fighters became available. It wasn't until 1939, nearly a decade after the project started, that the Red Army finally accepted the carriers with an order for 40 carriers, equally divided amongst the Navy and Army. But by this point, some military planners were beginning to doubt the whole project. For one, the TB-3 bomber was now obsolete. Next to modern aircraft like an American B-17, the TB-3 with its crude lines, looked more like farm equipment. And there were doubts about whether the slow lumbering bombers could still be effective in combat. Meanwhile, the situation in Europe was beginning to worry the Soviets. By 1940, Nazi Germany had conquered much of Europe and military planners feared that the Soviet Union was next. With war on the horizon, resources were shifted to the production of proven weapons. And it meant only five Zvino carriers were ever delivered, and even those were pulled from duty in the summer of 1940, dismantled and put into storage. It seemed like Vakmastrov's efforts would amount to nothing. But with the Soviet Union's darkest hour approaching, Zvino carriers were about to make history. On June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany launched a massive attack on the Soviet Union. Unprepared, Soviet defenses quickly crumbled. In the south, the Red Army scrambled to slow the advance towards the vital port cities of Odessa and Sevastopol by launching counterattacks on Nazi-allied Romania. A critical target for the Soviets was the King Carol I Bridge, as its destruction would cut a vital railway and oil pipeline, and disrupt the flow of supplies to Romanian troops. For days, the Soviets tried to take out the bridge using conventional bombers. But each time, the bombers missed their targets and faced heavy resistance from anti-aircraft guns and enemy fighters. It was soon apparent that only precision dive bombers would have any chance of destroying the bridge. But the Soviet Union was critically short on capable dive bomber crews, and existing fighters lacked the range to reach the bridge. So the Red Army raced to pull the Zvino carriers from storage and bring them back into working order. Ordinarily, an I-16 fighter loaded up with nearly a third of its weight in bombs would have never made it off the runway. But the heavily loaded Zvino carriers had no trouble lifting off. Before striking the bridge, the Zvino pilots cut their teeth attacking an oil refinery. Forty kilometers from the target, four fighters detached from their carriers and headed towards the refinery. Patrolling fighters didn't even try to intercept the I-16s. After all, a Soviet fighter could have never made it so far behind enemy lines. So they were assumed to be friendly. The Zvino fighters made a devastating attack on the refinery. Amongst the confusion the enemy couldn't even return fire. The first ever use of Zvino in combat was a huge success. In the early hours of August 10, three Zvino carriers left to attack the King Carol Bridge. Although one carrier had to turn back due to mechanical problems, the remaining fighters pushed on. Taking on heavy anti-aircraft fire, they managed to strike the bridge. But while damaged it remained standing. So three days later the attack was repeated. This time six fighters launched from the carriers. Again they were met with fierce anti-aircraft fire, but the nimble I-16s managed to score five direct hits, completely destroying one of the bridge's spans. And they returned home without any losses. The Zvino carriers were proving to be far more useful than originally thought capable of making sudden and unexpected attacks against difficult-to-reach targets. On August 17, Zvino carriers destroyed a dry dock in Constanta. On the 28th, they destroyed crossings on the Dnieper River, helping to significantly slow the advance of Nazi troops. On September 9, after yet another successful bombing raid, two I-16 fighters shot down a pair of BF-109s. But after that, records stop. The Soviet Union was only at the beginning of the most devastating war in history. Zvino carriers continued to fly under increasingly dire circumstances, and little is known about their ultimate fate. But there were at least 30 successful missions. While outdated by the time they saw action, the carriers proved to be highly effective, even if they were ultimately a desperate attempt to do what could have been done with modern capable dive bombers. And once dive bombers and well-trained crews became available in larger numbers, Zvino fell out of favor but Vakmastrov wasn't alone in his dream. The United States experimented with enormous aircraft carrying airships, and later bombers to carry fighters over great distances. But the concept always seemed a little too ahead of its time. Until the late 1960s, when emerging technologies promised to open up new possibilities. Major advances in aerodynamics, exotic new materials and propulsion would soon pave the way for aircraft many times larger than anything in existence. The Zvino carriers proved that sometimes, 
the wildest ideas can become deadly realities. But what do you think? Was this an innovation ahead of its time or just a failed experiment? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this deep dive into aviation history, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more incredible stories.